working for Mambo was great. Um, but to, the way I ended up at Mambo was Nick and I started our own clothing label called Umgawa out of Point Lonsdale in about 1990. And um, <laughs> the Umgawa comes from, you know, Tarzan <laughs> and um, also from the Huda Guru song, you know, yeah. Leilani. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we were doing our own thing and we, were, we got really successful, but we were idiots, you know. We, yeah. we weren't businessmen. Yeah. And we were – it's that classic thing of you get too successful too quickly mm. and the whole thing falls over. Yeah. You know, like um, we just – we took all these orders. We thought, oh, yeah, then we didn't have any money mm. to actually produce the orders, to, to fill the orders. So we had to borrow money at, you know, pro- what are, commercial rates – to create the stuff mm. and ship it out and then wait to get paid. And then you can only do that for so long. Mm. You know, it's like you're just like a rat on a wheel. Yeah. And then one of our big, um, one of the people we supplied, one of our big clients went bust. And that was the end of us. Through them, we kind of went and played all the major festivals in Australia. We went to Canada and America and New Zealand and just had a lovely time traveling the world playing great songs that's an unusual way to join a band yeah and he yeah. looked like jesus he the direct approach hair, just rock up to the gig with your instrument go come on was, let's that, you, go. was that your first band that you played with or like toured no i think so yeah on a there was, level? well there was another band spot the dog around about the same time spot the dog yeah okay <laughs> great name <laughs> um songs are a lot better though it okay. was um uh, this fellow in Brisbane called Mark Kryle started it and he's um, he's quite a prolific and amazing kind of undiscovered songwriter from Brisbane and now he's he's still involved in various projects there. But, um, but yeah, they, um, they kind of played this sort of rootsy sounding music where everything was really sort of sad and depressing. Actually, I remember there was this festival in Rockhampton where we were kind of billed between Blinky Bill and... Um, the Blinky Bill, uh, yeah, like the probably. cartoon Blinky yeah, yeah. Bill. Blinky Bill and maybe like the, <laughs> the equivalent Wiggles. of the Wiggles because um, they must have thought we were a kids act. But we just got up and played these kind of sad sounding rootsy songs and just all these kids were crying. Get, it's uh, great. Oh, you made the yeah. kids cry. Yeah, yeah. Gee. They just went, this isn't Spot the Dog. Where's Spot no, the Dog? Where's Spot the Dog? <laughs> you bastards. Yeah. A lot of disappointed children in the audience. Yeah, I've disappointed a lot of people in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's been good. By choice. Yeah. <laughs> Therefore, the bands are a little bit different. On oftentimes, I've been very lucky that I, I haven't had to work with any wackadoo conductors because, believe me, that's a topic of topic of conversation always among uh, Broadway musicians about you know how. Um, Oftentimes, you get stuck working with a, with a guy that really shouldn't be there, you know, because of politics. Uh, he is there, but not because he is a great conductor. So mm. that can always be challenging. And but and oftentimes, again, because of the nature of what I do, uh, I'll get called to a show that's on a click track. So if it's on a click track. You know, you're pretty safe, you know, it's pretty conductor proof in terms of that, you know, because one of the big problems with with um, some conductors is that, you know, they just don't know how to give you the the, the great downbeat, the one, you know, they're, because, you know, uh, like a classical players, um, they they have learned to follow the idiosyncrasies of conductors because they're just such brilliant musicians and they know music well and all of that. But, you know, if you're, if you don't have a click track and you have a conductor that's all over the place and the drummer's trying to follow him and my cousin walks me up to my house and I can't talk. Um, uh, So my house is like, does he speak? Can he say anything? (laughs) You know, but that night I went home and said, okay, you know, quit the basketball team, sell my bike, broke up with my girlfriend, got a job at the local gas station, pumping gas, dealing with some transmissions. I knew some things because I was fixing my bike all the time. And um, I worked Christmas 
through the year. I work every day after school, every time and a half to, to get this cash to go buy this kit. So that drum set, which I still have, and I use it on Vivid. Uh, I, I played on it in high school through Berkeley College with Harry Belafonte and then on to Living Color and then made it on to Vivid as well. Uh, 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 that was kind of like my beginning. I jog every morning as soon as I wake up and then I jog late at night, you know, in the middle of recording at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, I jog around the block here. But yeah, I'm jogging around the harbour, so it's beautiful. Um, and I still play tennis. Well, I killed my tennis player uh, uh, two days ago. Not killed him, but he he, uh, he he got this calf injury. They had to carry him off the court. Jesus. So he was my opponent. So now I still play tennis a few times a week. I have to find a new opponent, and I'm looking forward to cricket. But I, I don't know what's going to happen with cricket this year. It's meant to start in September. Can't see it happening. Can you? Yeah, I can because you can actually have. Um the required distances, you know, you can put a fielder there, you can put a fielder there, you know, there. The batsmen are, uh, what, what, six, is it six metres, the pitch? 22, 20, 22 yards. 22 yards. So that, that's, you know, sufficient enough to have the distance. It's just where the uh, the batsmen, the, the opposition, while they're waiting to bat, it's them, you know, waiting in the grandstand to get on. They need to have separation. So you might have, you know, it could be done. You could have one person on the other side of the ground, another person, you know. Uh, look, the one thing that I'm pleased they've stopped is spitting on the ball. I I really, really loathe It just reminds me of growing up with my brother. He used to spit all the time. Uh, it used to revolt me. I'm, I was a protected species when I was young, mainly because of my respiratory problems, and I think the spitting thing is disgusting. And sat up there in the art centre, and I was like, I love that place. I've got good memories from that yeah. from that tent. Somewhere on the other side of the world, yeah. <laughs> I guess it started there, right, in Edinburgh and then came to Australia. It did, yeah, yeah. it did. I mean, that was, it was the... there for a lot longer, yeah, it was there for years. It, yeah. it, it had a beautiful place uh, in Edinburgh on the, on the river there and, um, yeah, and then suddenly it was in Melbourne, yeah. And I wasn't really – I don't think I was living in Melbourne at the time. I think I was, I was probably living in Germany at the time when it was in Melbourne. So, but I did see it when I came back and visited family or whatever. Mm. Yeah, uh, I started playing around the traps as, as, as a very young kid, and um, but by the seventies, um, I already formed my first band. It was named actually was named uh, Black Venom. What a silly name, <laughs> but that's what it was called. And um, yeah, it was the times. Yeah, Black Venom. What a name. And uh, so I had that band for a few years and we were playing, you know, local local gigs and things like that. We were just school kids. And um, I remember my dad, because my dad taught me guitar originally. I remember my dad saying, I can see this is what you want to do and I can see that everything else is not important to you. So if you're going to do it, do it right. So he, he kind of told me to, to find forget having my own band and find bands that are working that are, so I can make a few dollars at least. So I started doing a lot of uh, private parties and weddings and things like that. But um, it was tough for me because I always had this uh, part of me that liked writing songs and doing my own thing or playing. And even when, if I would play a cover, I would like to change it around. It was just a creative side of me, I guess, being a songwriter. And I, and I refused to play a cover identical. So that was really good for me because, as I said, you know, I wasn't really good at – I wasn't really that academic, wasn't good at maths, but I somehow could find my way through it because the core of it was music. That sounds pretty interesting, uh, just that transition that you went through, which is a, um, you know, what, a 15-year-old boy – Putting out bin somewhere, working in a, you said a chemist, right? Yeah, yeah. I used to take the uh, I used to take the drugs to all the elderly around Canton on my push bike. Yeah, were you were you taking their drugs while you were t- on your push bike? Well, if you saw the names of them, they're not stuff that you want to be putting in your system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, even that, like, and that the resilience of doing that, like, we did it. I did it three nights a week. You know, I'd go to footy training and then I'd go and empty the bins and like. You know, it was cr- like I'd have to even empty like the waxing bin, you know, where they do eyebrows and stuff. I'd have to like 
be emptying that. So when I got the job at the music shop, I'm going, this is a walk in the park. I don't have to touch eyebrows. Great. So they, they sold vinyl records as well in the music yeah, shop? They yeah, they did. And we did, I mean, primarily, at the, especially at the start, it was CDs. And CD, it was really interesting because everyone kept on saying to me, even back then in 2008, CDs are, you know, that was when the iPod was really pumping and, you know, and um, yeah, and it was like, you know, who comes in here? On the road, all of a sudden is this massive big stag. stag. It was insane. Just, was just in the middle of the road as we're driving on this like, it, and it was huge. It, no, it was, yeah, it was a male obviously and it, he was huge. And, and it like we, stopped and looked at us. And we had to stop the like, car. And like, we're like, I'm like, what's going on here? Anyway, and then it just out of nowhere just took off up the hill and I said to, I'm like, that means something. Check I'm it like, out, That check means it. something. I'm like, I don't care what anyone says but that is you know, and then, yeah, I looked it up and it said, you know, new beginnings and things sort of coming up and, you know, going to change, it's going to be changes. And that was like and around Darling the Hurst. time that we had just met Jason, just spoken to Pete, just met Jason, um, you know, other things going on in our lives. And it really was, it, it really did, our whole lives kind of shifted, yeah. didn't they? It was, but it was amazing. Yeah, sort of like, <laughs> it sounds like it's a bad thing. Because Pagan like, was like literally going, oh, no, it's just a stag on the road. I'm like, how often do you see a stag on the road? And it really <laughs> changed everything. Yeah, it did. It was unbelievable. Yep. yep. I became very single and very old. single as opposed to married. I'm <laughs> 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 oh, sorry, I just said you. <laughs> it's all right, I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's always but, a, but an it was a, such a big turnaround for us. Like everything that could have possibly going like one way all of a sudden was like flipped on its head yeah, and it was. it was like everything was just – it happened like so rightly. It was just, it was great. 